Okay. All right. Oh, there she is, just in time. Okay, so hopefully you've got some of the material in your mind still from the past two days. We were talking a lot about, hi, Kyla, welcome. Glad you made it. Uh, so we're talking about, uh, what were we talking about? Let me go back. Conclusions. Oh, okay, yeah. Viscoelasticity. Um, remember how when you apply a load and then you take off the load, the release of the strain is um, releases slowly. It's not immediate. And when you when you, the relaxation response is when you have a constant load, the strain that you feel lessens over time. Um, training leads to adaptations of decreased decreased heat release, so you don't get as sweaty when you're more trained. Oops, and cycl cycl cyclical repetitive motions de also decreases heat release and resistance. And environmental temperature may have an effect on connective tissue performance, but the research is not conclusive on that. All right, so day three, we're going to talk about structure and composition, mainly of connective tissue. So I'm just going to start off by saying this is going to be kind of detailed and it may feel like over information or more than you would need, but just stick with me, just follow along, ask questions if you need to. Don't stress yourself out about remembering everything. But I just want to give you kind of a foundational understanding. And when we're done talking about the whole thing, I feel like that's when it'll be more, uh, it'll make more sense. So just stick with me through the details. And, um, and I, I think I hope it'll be valuable. I think it will be. All right. So we're going to talk about anatomy of connective tissue. What is connective tissue? Ideas? You guys think you know what that is you want to what does that mean connective tissue so we have our internal organs we have the nervous system we have our brain we have our heart we have all the things that operate to keep our bodies um, from getting sick like the liver it, it uh, filters things out of our blood. So we have all this other stuff going on, uh, the digestive system, the reproductive system, the elimination system. So what holds it all together? That's kind of the general category of connective tissue. And it's made up of bone, which provides that solid internal structure cartilage which is in between joints connective tissue proper which means the tendons the ligaments and the joint capsules adipose tissue is also connective tissue believe it or not and there's one here that i didn't mention but i'll i talk about it later is blood and the reason why they're all put together as connective tissue is because they come from the same set of cells in the embryo they come from that same same um place so that's why they're all lumped together but obviously blood is a fluid and it's very different but it's put into the category of connective tissue so we're going to talk about the biochemistry of connective tissue the cells the fibers and something called the extracellular matrix which is all the stuff that like the fluidy gooey stuff very scientific fluidy gooey so the reason why uh, i divided into this is because they're actually pretty similar but there's differences in the kind of cells the kinds of fibers and what's in the matrix and that's what differentiates these different types of connective tissue from each other they're sort of like 
siblings. There's thing they come from the same kind of material, but they specialize into different areas. And they still have some things similar to each other. Sorry, it keeps doing that. So that they they kind of melt into each other, like the bone and the cartilage are connected by the the um the gooey stuff, and then like the tendon and the ligaments, they the they are infused into the muscle but then as they thicken and come to the ends they uh, continue so there, there's it's hard to really separate them from each other because of this kind of uh, melting into each other that that they have and bone even has this has like layers of of uh, connective tissue on top of it you can peel it away um, and then it's infused into it. So the connective tissue are all connected to each other. That's one way to think of it. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, they flow into each other. So what is the difference in terms of cells? So in certain in areas that become bone, there are cells called osteoblasts, and they produce calcium. And that calcifies that part of the connective tissue and that becomes bone. Chrondocytes is another type of cell and they are in the area where there's going to be cartilage and they form the cartilage. Fibrocytes is in connective tissue proper like the ligaments and the tendons and the joint capsules and they produce collagen and elastin in different proportions depending on what part of the body it is and then adip adipocyte produce adipose tissue and also i want to add in here that these special cells are the ones they have the nucleus meaning they have the dna for that particular organism and the one thing that i learned when i was in cellular bi biology that was so interesting to me is really what makes the different parts of our body specialize is the kind of protein that they produce. So the cells that eventually become liver produces a certain protein that makes that that organ become a liver and et cetera, et cetera. So proteins, that's why they call it the building block of the body because that's what makes everything differentiate and have a different role. Okay, questions so far? Okay, everybody good? Okay. If you start glaze your eyes start glazing over, just stop me and you know we'll we'll slow it down or we'll answer questions. Okay, so next is the fibers. So one thing to remember about fibers is form follows function. Okay, so this meaning the fiber is going to um, be structured based on its purpose, based on what it does, its function in the body. So let me move this over so you can see on the bottom. Oh, you can't see, okay. So right here we have this handy little um, image that separates a different type of fibers or fiber distribution. So here is the dense, densely populated fibers, something in the middle, and then loose. So the superficial fascia near the surface, like as part of the derma, part of the skin, is loose. That means the fibers of collagen are just kind of spread out. Right. These are collagen and elastin, depending on where you are and what your uh, genetics are. And then myofascia, which is what uh, Manny was talking about earlier, is somewhere in the middle. It's not loose like what's in your skin, but it's not dense either, like what's in your deep fascia and these other areas. OK, and then the, the denser fibers are in the deep fascia. But notice how it's irregular. 
and then here upon her neuroses um that is uh, in a different area of the body not the musculoskeletal and then ligaments is all uh, one line and then tendons are irregular that shows it here as going in this direction but really it's it's it it can be slightly different than that this is just for simplification so for example the ligaments is unidirectional right when you are when you're contracting a muscle and you want that the ligament to that's attached from the muscle to the bone you want to pull that joint into flexion, for example, it's a unidirectional you know, pull. So the ligaments are, are dense and they're regular in this one particular direction. Oh, sorry, tendons are regular too. Sorry, I got that confused. So tendons also are regular and um, deep fascia, which is not unidirectional it's just uh something that holds everything together it has to move in different directions so it's irregular because if you had it all in a regular position you wouldn't have the variety of movements possible so that makes sense hopefully you guys okay so the fibers are collagen reticular and elastin that's supposed to be elastin sorry reticular is not in the musculoskeletal that's in places like uh, blood vessels okay all right any questions on those everybody okay so this remember this is collagen and elastin basically all right and i wanted to show you this because there's a difference between irregular fibers and disorganized fibers Disorganized fibers is a response or a um, result of dysfunction, like if you have insufficient movement, people who are sedentary, they don't move their muscles around. The fascia just sits there or the um, fibers just sit there and they, they are, there's nothing acting on them. So they get kind of just, they go whichever way. Or inadequate loading, not enough um, load, not enough challenge, injury, surgery, trauma, or collagen accumulation. So this particular example, really fascinating to me, I found in a study. Here's the, if you want to look at it, this is the reference. So the electron microscopy microscopy image shows here is healthy scar containing collagen type 5. So there's different types of collagen, but we don't need to go into that. So the scar fibers are smoothly arranged in parallel order. Right here on the right side is an unhealthy scar and the collagen type 5, but it's all disconnect, dis, disorganized and it's uh, you know just disarray of scar fibers. So there's actually modalities, hands-on modalities that work with scar tissue to, to make it more in this organized way. It just is uh, theoretically better for function. So let's say, for example, you have a student that's had um, a mastectomy. So there's going to be scar tissue on their chest. That muscle, even though they may be fully recovered, the fibers in that area are going to be different than if there had been no surgery. So the, the um, mobility or flexibility or movement that you can expect to see in that person, especially in that area, is going to be different. Of course, that's, you know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe they've done a lot of work on it. Maybe they've, they're genetically, they recovered better. But that's something that you, you need to keep in mind. So, for Amy, example. Amy, can I interrupt? Uh-huh. 
Can I interrupt about 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 those women with C-section? How will it affect their performance? So C-section is interesting. It's it's a it's a straight line, right? Yeah. Usually, so it's it cut all the layers, and so the recovery the recovery is. I haven't looked up any research on that, and I haven't seen much of a difference in women in my class who've had C-sections and haven't seen had C-sections. So it might That's be, that the, yeah, that the recovery from that is, is not as complicated. Um, but I, I don't have- The reason I ask you that is because many of the women mm -hmm. uh, students they will have, uh, many of them may have, may have had C-section. Do you see any difference in their performance? Sometimes when there is a extreme, uh, say back bend when you have really to stretch your abs yeah sometimes they they feel like you know they will rupture their so they their, feel that yeah so then they it, feel, yeah but I, i'm not sure if it, yeah. it is bad or it is harmful i do not know that's why yeah I'm i don't know you. either <laughs> i don't know either you would have to the in that case they really need to listen to their body mm -hmm. and 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 follow those cues because cause we don't know. We just don't know. Yeah, if they feel like it's going to rupture, then they should not push it. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I, I remember having one, one student, this was really interesting. She was an older lady, but she had a, some kind of a flesh eating thing, bacteria thing. So it, it ate up the muscles in her back. And she recovered and she had, she had great health insurance. Everything was fine, took care of her, but it was, she couldn't do like back extension because the muscles in her lower back just weren't the same. They weren't the same. So that's a good thing to understand. I feel like, all right. So the next thing talked about cells that are different and the different uh, different between the different connective tissue types talked about fibers and the organization of the fibers. So next is the extracellular matrix. That's all that gooey stuff. So if you have something like the loose fibers here, there's going to be more extracellular matrix to fill in the spaces than if you have something really dense. So here you have more fiber, less of the gooey stuff. Here you have less fibers, more of the gooey stuff, right? Makes sense, right? And this, this extracellular matrix is really important because it holds things like um, immunity cells and uh, what else? It'll hold proteins, it'll hold nutrients. So it's actually really important it's not just a water filler. Okay, so let's see. So a uh, part of the extracellular matrix is the ground, something called ground substance, which is that jelly-like substance holding the cells, fibers, and the extracellular matrix. In the bone, the ground substance is calcified, making it a more solid structure. It's a scaffolding with fiber proteins that provide support and it holds special cells that produce specific proteins. So that's those um, cells that I was talking about earlier that produce either collagen or elastin or calcium. Okay. So connective tissue proper. Now we're gonna talk about the specific sets of connective tissue. These contain fibroblasts, as I said earlier, that produce collagen and elastin. Fibroblast is like a little, think of it as a cell, a living cell, a human cell, that's like a little factory, a little protein factory. And this is loose connective tissue. Are, the loose connective tissue are the areola surrounding the organs, connects skin to muscles, mostly filler and very few fibers. Adipose tissue stores energy, the white kind, I guess there's two kinds of, yes, Yes, Kat. Oh, um, I just have a question. Um, the flat, the uh, the two slides before the, it was 
the disorganized connective tissue. So this is like the healthy tissue that we're looking at now, like normal connective tissue or like this the one. A, this, is, this is scar tissue. That's scar tissue. But the one we're looking at now is the like healthy, normal connective this- not Which this one? one. The one that the slide we were just on, like. Oh, oh, oh. This no, 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 no. This one. No, no, no. This one. <laughs> this is like this one. This one? This is like normal tissue. Like this is how it's supposed yeah. to be. Well, okay. do I have a picture here? I don't have a picture here. You talking about a picture? No, I just mean like when it says connect no. you proper. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um that means that it's like the normal how it's supposed to be. Uh, no, proper meaning the tendons, the ligaments, and the joint capsules. Oh, maybe, I don't know, maybe proper doesn't mean what I think it means. It doesn't mean what you think it means. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was confusing to me too. Not okay. proper as in opposed to improper, but mm-hmm. proper meaning the regular connective tissue, like what we, the the, it's also what we have the most of, and it's what we, what we're more concerned about as far as the musculoskeletal system. Okay. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh yeah, you're welcome. And so adipose tissue, the white adipose tissue stores energy and the brown adipose tissue produce heat. And then reticular tissue, this is what I was talking about. The This is not necessarily what we're concerned about, but this is in the bone marrow the surrounding kidney, it surrounds the kidneys, the spleen, and the lymph nodes. And then dense connective tissue has more collagen and elastin. Regular tissue, which is the regularly ordered fibers, ligaments and tendons. Irregular tissue is multidirectional movement and is in the, like, for example, the dermis of the skin. And elastic tissue is, has more elastin and there are in some organs like the large arteries. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. Tendons. I thought I'd just show you a picture because here's where, where collagen is. So we talk about collagen and here's where it is. That's how it's arranged. Collagen molecules are arranged in a triple helix configuration that bundle together in a hierarchical structure. So you have a little bundle and then another bundle, another bundle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of reminds me of muscle. And it looks like muscle. So what's the difference between muscle and tendons? Real quick. Hmm. Muscles have contractile tissues. That means they can shorten. Tendons don't. but they look similar. So, okay, cartilage has dense collagen and elastin fibers. The chondrocytes in cells produce the fibers and ground substance. Cartilage are avascular, meaning they don't have a blood supply and they are not innervated, means they don't have nerves, which means also that they don't have pain receptors. So when you do feel pain, like in your joints, Where do you think you're feeling that? I don't have an answer for that question. I just thought I'd put it out there. So something to think about, hmm. But the danger in that is if we are wearing out our cartilage before that point of pain, since there are no receptors there, we won't know until it's too late, unfortunately. So, you know, people always say, oh, yeah, I have pain in my hip and I went to the doctor and they did this and it's bone on bone. So it's almost like they didn't know anything was going wrong until, boom, they're bone on bone. Yeah. All right. Nutrients Mm -hmm. supply. Yeah. That explains it, especially the knee knee area. I have Mm -hmm. a lot of friends who have already had knee replacement, two knees. (laughs) Some Mm -hmm. of them one knee. Because they felt the pain after all the the cartilages are all destroyed. Already because gone. our knee is surrounded with cartilages, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. That's that explains it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I know. It's just really too bad. 
Uh, nutrients supply, nutrient supply comes via diffusion from the extracellular matrix. So that gooey stuff is what provides the nutrients to the cartilage. It's similar to bones uh, biochemically, and it becomes bone when it's calcified and when the chondrocytes die. So it's possible that as you lose cartilage, you also gain bone. And that contributes more to that bone on bone um, condition. So chondroitin is a material that gives cartilage more flexibility than bone is, is, and is sometimes taken as a supplement. Okay. We're on time. Okay. Three types of cartilage. Hyaline is the most abundant. It's in the joints, interior ends of the ribs, nose, and vocal cords. Provides smooth movement has thin fibrils of collagen and the lots of ground substance. Fibrocartilage is tough and strong, like in the knees and the discs, the vertebrae discs, vertebral discs, portions of joints and the pub, oh, sorry, inter, intervertebral disc portions of joints and pubic symphysis, that's our little pubic bone in the front uh, it resists strong compression and tension and is very thick in collagen. Oh, that's that's what they call it, uh, the disc between the vertebrae. Yes. It's a fibrocartilage. Yes. Mm, I have three three of my mine like that are busted. <laughs> oh, darn. They, they got uh, compressed too much. Oh. They call it disc herniation. It's herniated already. Herniated, yeah. Yeah. But they've healed, right? They've no, healed. No, they cannot. When you compress it, that's why you need to prop it up with your muscle, your back. Oh, muscles. I see. Yeah. And your, and your, uh, Posture. and your abs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I took up yoga because of that. Oh, that's right. I remember that now. Good. So fibro cartilage. Okay. Fibro cartilage. Yeah, it's tougher than hyaline. And then elastic is abundant in elastin. Elastic cartilage, thin fibers of collagen, allows for repeated bending, and it's found in the, interesting enough, the eustachian tube of the inner ear, the outer ear, this one, and the epiglottis. So in our epiglottis, it covers the larynx when we swallow so that you don't go, you don't swallow down the wrong windpipe. Which one do you classify the, which one of that, the fibrocartilage, the Achilles tendon? Uh, that's Achilles tendon. It's probably hyaline. 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 Oh, that's why it breaks, huh? Uh, I guess I don't. You mean? Well, I don't. They I they don't. they break. They break. I I have a friend. Uh, her Achilles tendon broke. She can't. She can't walk after that. Oh, is she an athlete? No, we're just, you know, we're not at it, but we're playing tennis. <laughs> she, she damaged her. Oh, yeah. That's also what um, Jordan, right, Amanda? What? That's, didn't he rupture his Achilles tendon? Yeah. Yeah. That's why I asked, because he was an athlete. But, yeah, I don't know what makes him... Great. Clay Thompson also has a broken Clay Thompson, Kevin Durant. <laughs> oh, right. Athletes, right? Yeah, that's I've seen it in athletes. Heard of it in athletes. So the reasoning behind that, I don't know. Not enough stretching. Who's to say? I haven't done enough research on that to say. Um, but, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting to think about. I mean, could they have avoided it if they stretched more? Maybe. You know, there is there is definitely some re a lot of research, some research on the effects of, of stretching for athletes and preventing injury. I'm not read up on it, so, but I would imagine it's good. All right, so bone is osseous tissue. Calcium makes it strong. Structural support and protection, osteoblasts secrete collagen and ground substance, which are then classified, calcified. Okay. Fascia. Like I said, um, 
Jules Mitchell does not go very deep into fascia. She only put two pages in it. Uh, so I'm just giving you kind of a recap of that. Fascia is a sheath, a sheet, or any other dissectable aggregation of connective tissue to attack, enclose, and separate muscles, bones, organs, blood vessels, nerves, etc. According to this one researcher in 2016, tried to explain what it is. There's 12 categories of fascia, and these are three mentioned here in the book. Upon a neurosis is flat sheets of tendon-like tissue, interosseous membranes, sorry about the misspelling, connective tissue between two bones, like between the ulna and the radius in your arm, these two bones, the forearm, so the tissue between them. Um, periostem is connective tissue membrane surrounding bone, but excluding tendons, ligaments, and joint capsules. And research is not conclusive on the training and adaptation of fascia. So a lot of the talk in the last probably five, 10, 10 years or so has been on fascia being trainable and adaptive. And that's what's behind um, like uh, certain massage modalities. I can't remember what it's called now. Uh, ah, sorry, I forgot what it is, but it's very deep, slow, high, high pressure massage that follows the fa facial fascia lines. And there's, there's a lot of work being done on, uh, in fascia, but she doesn't go into it in her book, but I will go into it as our next topic in anatomy. Okay. Oops. Yeah. All right. So again, the last category, blood and, lymph, blood and lymph cells, is fluid containing salts, nutrients, and dissolved proteins, such as defense cells. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus, so they don't have the DNA information. There's no mechanical or supportive role, but they develop from the same set of embryonic cells, and that's why they're in that same family. But if you think about it, blood has a supportive roll, I mean, you can think about it as, you know, a bag that has fluid in it, has structure. So I don't know. That's just me though. Okay. Main conclusions. Connective tissue differ in terms of fiber content and direction and ground substance, amount of ground substance. Different cells produce the proteins that are needed for the different structures. Elastin and collagen are the main fibers for connective tissue in the musculoskeletal system. Connective tissue we are mainly concerned with are bone, tendons, ligaments, and fascia, which is to be covered in more detail at a later date. That's our next topic. Okay, I wanted to just talk about hypermobility real quick. All right, are we familiar with this hypermobility have you ever seen anybody who's hypermobile no not even yeah, you we can... had... yeah have you seen... yeah i've seen a lot m m many filipinos have uh, hyper extended uh, elbows knees you know mm, okay the lack of maybe uh growing up nutrients or even good uh yeah it's a product of uh you know, but the uh, nutrition also. Oh, interesting. That's Have why you... when I see those hyperextended elbows mm -hmm. on plank, I bend their elbows a little bit. Yeah, until they, they develop to... surrounding that uh, area. Strength Even the knees. Feet. Yeah, the knees. Many mm -hmm. of our, many, especially Japanese, it's genetic. Uh, oh. Bow legged, mm -hmm. our bow legged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Amanda, in your cheer world, you haven't met anybody who's hypermobile? I guess I have, yeah. Yeah, they're the ones that are super duper flexible. Like, yeah, well, I like people with hyperextended like knees and elbows usually don't do very well in cheer because everything has to be straight and is in line. So they don't do very well. Mm -hmm. um, but I have seen people with hypermobility. Yeah. Yeah, what the book says is that it is a genetic genetic variant in the molecular molecular structure of the collagen. Uh, it's research, not genetic. 
it's in the book says it it is but it I there's probably there's probably more than one condition of hypermobility the one she talks about in the book is that that there's a genetic variant in the structure of the collagen i've seen hypermobility in a uh, young adults that are autistic not autistic uh syndrome something syndrome uh, i think uh, i think the, I, amy uh, i'm forgetting the name attracts, attracts hypermobile people <laughs> oh yeah because they, their form of exercising because they're already good at they, it so they think they're good at it but yeah. they don't know it's down it's just syndrome going to be good for them. Huh? yeah yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I know what you mean. I'm going to I'm going to talk about that in a second, too. You're right. They they feel uh, accomplished because yeah. they can they can do the deep stretches. But also I've seen it in um, Down syndrome. They have hypermobility. Part of that, though, is because of the lax muscles. So and and the, they're not very active. They tend not to be not all of them there are some who are athletic but that is i've seen it in in that population so there's different reasons for hypermobility i guess maybe nutrition is part of it too like you said um, manny that would be an interesting thing to research if that's you know true or not so something for us to be aware as yoga teachers is to watch out for those students and you're right they are gonna they're going to want to go deep, but they're going to want to go beyond what may be safe because they don't feel anything unless they do. Right? They don't feel the stretch if they're just going the normal range of motion that that they see in everybody else. So they might overdo it and they could they could damage their joints. So you have to be aware of that and you you may have to pull them back. And I've had to do that a couple of times because you need to keep them safe. So, so that's something to keep in mind. All right. Next slide is just we some always, additional. We use. always have to put that in our mind, observing yeah. our students. <laughs> right. I because mean, you I know, you would, you would think that Oh, you have somebody really flexible in your class. Oh, let me push them. Let me see if I can yeah. get them to do this particular pose that nobody else can because uh, oh, they're, they're super flexible, right? You would that. Yeah. Generally, my observation of hypermobile people are weak. Hmm. They're weak. That's why you need to load them. That's why I, I want to know more about the biomechanics because the people, for example, the, the people who can do a lot of forward folds very, very deep. They're very, very weak in extending or in extending their legs in extension because they have very weak uh, hamstrings. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's the that's what, what I notice. Right. Yeah. So it's important to keep in mind the principle of balance and shtira sukha. So shtira is strength or stability. Sukha is ease or relaxation. So we can't go overboard in either direction. We want a balance of the two. So if you have somebody who's hypermobile, you're going to want to help them to, to understand that concept that, no, we need to balance your body, balance your flexibility with strength and stability. And there's a couple of resources here that I found. Hypermobility on the mat, a guide to hypermobility aware yoga teaching and practice. And then too flexible to feel good, a practical roadmap to managing hypermobility. Those of you curious and you want to look those up. All right. Adele Bridges, Adele Bridges is a very hyper, she should know because she's a very, very flexible person. Oh, is she? I don't know her. You know her? Yeah, yeah. She's, I like that book because she's a, a, an example of hypermobility. Oh, interesting. <laughs> she was able to strengthen herself. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's cool. She's a Latina, I think. She's Latina. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's all I have as far as the biomechanics for today. 
Um, next time we have one more chapter in the biomechanics book about adaptability. I'm going to see if I can cover that in the one hour lecture that we have. And then I also want to get into more teaching methodology. And the next topic that I want to address is finding meaning in finding what meaning in like attaching meaning to the physical part yeah. of <clears throat> the practice. So making it more than a posture, but making it a um, giving it a meditative quality, something for your mind to ponder, you know, the physical part practice. So think about that. Uh, let's take a five minute break. And we'll talk a little bit more about that idea, and then we'll have a meditative flow practice. Okie dokie. Any questions? Any other questions? No? Everybody? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Amanda, you can. Gonna... Te things about some features. They connect, for example, stored emotions in the hips. They say that, you know, uh, let's open the hips because it will release those. Uh, negative emotions, stuff like that. Don't you think we are stretching our 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 teaching too much? Because human emotion is so complex that <laughs> you know, to even think about yes. opening the head will be or the heart for, for that matter. Yes. You know, so uh, my thoughts on that is what I've been taught is that trauma can get stored in the body. So when you've experienced trauma, there's a certain physiological effect that stays somewhere in your body, stays in your tissues. So yes, we've been taught in yoga teacher training that um, trauma from relationships, for example, are in your hips. So when you stretch out your hips, you're, you're, you may get emotional, you may release some of that trauma, release some of that past pain. Personally, I hadn't experienced that in my hips, but I, I have experienced other release, physical release through the back of my heart, the back side of my heart. Um, but I have had a student who has had a very, who had a very real reaction of a chest opening. And this was in a class about maybe eight years ago. It was only her, fortunately, in class. And she was new. This was maybe her third or fourth class. She was not a yogi. She had not heard any of this before. And we were doing a twist that opened your chest a little bit. And then all of a sudden she became quite emotional. We stopped practicing. I let her sit and let her calm down. And she started to tell me her story. She was abandoned as a child because her mother couldn't take care of her. And she, oh. um, she was maybe, I think she was somewhere between eight and nine years old. And she go, went into a phone booth back when they had phone booths. And she just, she just was trying to get somebody to help her. And, and she, a policeman came and, and got her and yeah. helped, helped her and put her in the system so that she could get foster care. And she just started telling me all of this, all of her story. Mm -hmm. And she was an incredibly compassionate, kind, loving, sweet person, not bitter, not angry. She eventually met a really wonderful man, you know, got married, had two wonderful children, great mom, but she had kind of held it in this certain amount of pain. And she said when she felt that opening across her chest, it just all came out in tears. So she was crying. She was very emotional. So we just, we talked about it and we tried to do a little bit more practice, but we didn't really do much more than that. Um, so that kind of tells me that, okay, maybe, yeah, 
it it does have something you know the, you know the reason why i asked you that mm -hmm. because reading through mitchell's uh, book she mentioned about anecdotal yes. situations in teaching yoga to the point that uh, these are not well founded or an independent research was really done if that is real the effect so when we claim something like that she mentioned about you know a team winning just because you're wearing their jersey <laughs> not because of the effect of yoga practice in the team is stretching the the practice too much that is yeah what i so, read into her book that you know sometimes yeah we have to be careful in using we those. Do. Yeah, so because, I do not, when I put people in hip opening, I do not suggest that they are releasing trauma from relationships. I don't ever say that. I don't ever say that. But if something like this happens, like this with one of my students, then I, I respect it. And I honor it as their experience. And I'm a little bit open-minded that these things can happen, but I don't use it in general mm -hmm. does that make sense i don't like say everybody this is what this is i'm open you know, to it i'm open to it when it happens but i don't use it as a selling point for practicing does that Mitch, make sense is a bit, uh, her book is a little bit uh, although she's, she likes yoga but she's now raising questions about the things that we say during a class, which to me, yeah, we are maybe for marketing, we're over promising too much. Over promise, yeah, that's so, a good. Oh, yeah, she, she's right in, in a way that uh, sometimes we are so protective of students who has risk, risk problem, so we avoid making her do planks or, or downward facing dog to put load on her wrist, you know, stuff like that. So I do not know, uh, maybe in your in your teaching us, Maybe you can really relate those experiences and uh, what Mitchell is saying about because I don't have that much extensive experience in teaching people. Running a studio, yeah, but teaching people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gave yes. me a lot of things to, to think about, you know. And, it, and it's going to depend on the person too. I mean, there may be people who are less susceptible to holding things in their body, you know, or maybe they have, they have, they, they release it immediately and and so they don't keep it in for years and years and years it's it's a very subjective thing yeah. so okay, i'm okay. aware that it can happen but i don't i don't preach it mm -hmm. yeah. yeah okay good okay. all right good okay. discussion thank you guys you. everybody yeah, good yeah yeah all right, so let's take a quick break. We'll get organized, get our mats. Amanda, you're going to go to, you have to go to your stunt team. Okay, honey, be safe. Be safe, practice safe, and Thank you. we'll see you next time. Okay, Bye. love you. Bye. Love you too. How is the uh, typhoon, the test storm? Raging I know, it's so there. rainy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's really wet. <laughs> yep. Okay, Manny, I'll be back in about five minutes. Okay. Okay.
Manny, do you have bolsters or any kind of restorative props? Now or in the studio? Uh, both. Ah, in the in the house, I only have a bolster and maybe a yoga wheel here, but most of them are in the studio. Oh, okay. chair here, and stuff like that. Do you have a blanket? Oh, I, oh, I was yeah. just gonna I, try to use it, but you have a bolster then? I, I'll get it. It's, it's downstairs. I'll get it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. What do you what more? Yeah, yeah the just mm. the a bolster, just the, not just the, bolster and maybe a a, we might use a blanket, but definitely a bolster. Okay. Okay. I'll go down and get it. Okay. 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 Hi, Kyla. How are you? Good. Good. What, what do I need anything? I don't have a bolster. But yeah, but I like do. A blanket? But I I have a blanket. I also have my like. I sometimes use this like body pillow as a bolster. My. Oh yeah, that looks kind of bolster like. Like bolster like, it's kind of long, but it has that same like kind of dimension density. Mm hmm. Um, I have pillows too. I have a blanket. I have blocks. Um, what do you think I should grab? Um. Well, I I. You can. You can use the bolster, but but I'm gonna have you use the blanket just so I can show you how. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then you, you also have your blocks close by, right, Kyla? I was, I just realized that I have an orchid and Tita showed me how to like water it by like putting, taking it out and putting it into like a bowl, bowl of water. <laughs> and I just realized I it was supposed to be in there for 30 minutes. I left it there all for like five days. So oh. I not dead. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> I like round it, poor thing. Is it okay? I hope so. I don't know. I'm not really good at taking care of plants. I'm not. I'm, anything. I'm bad. I'm bad too. And it's supposed to be very yogi like to have plants. Very like nurturing. And, uh... you have plants in your studio place. <laughs> I know. I'm bad at it, but I have one that's managed to live. It's a monstera plant. What's it called? Monstera, like monster with an A at the end. It's actually done really well because they like, they don't need a lot of water. So it's fantastic. It's doing great. It's my first successful plant. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's over there in my other yoga space. I'm going to try another one. I'm going to try something called ponytail palm. It's really cute. I want another one by my, by my yoga mat over there. Okay. We got our props, everybody. <clears throat> awesome. Okay, so just a little bit of um, discussion. So meditative flow, the way that I teach it, is really peaceful. Um, I don't talk a lot, a lot. <clears throat> And I don't necessarily lead, you know, a really intricate meditation. And it has more qualities of like a restorative class where it's supported 
gentle stretching but there's movement too like gentle flow so i can't really call it a restorative class because restorative it's fully propped out lots of blankets lots of um and it's supportive uh type of assist so that you are really really just zoning out and typically you'll stay in a restorative supported pose for maybe 10 minutes and if it's done right you won't even feel like it's been that long just because you're so super relaxed it's a certain skill i am not i don't consider myself a restorative type teacher i'm just I mean, I've learned it. I've taken a, a workshop on it, um, but I'm not super skilled at it. So mine is more of a gentle flow. I call it a meditative flow because there is more silence and you, you have a chance to kind of just be in your mind. And it's a, it's a supported enough of a release for your body, but not so much that you're you know zoned out for 10 10 minutes so i love to start a meditative flow with a gentle heart heart opening and that's what the prop is for so if you were to use a bolster like for you manny and i we might have done this before so you're gonna lay down with your tailbone on the floor and then the rest of your spine is going to be on the bolster so go ahead and get into that position, Manny, and then I'm going to talk to Kyla. For Kyla, we're going to use a blanket just so that you have, um, you know, not a, there. There's bolsters can be kind of an investment, so you may or may not have that available. But you can do the same thing with a blanket. So what you want to do is um, roll it or fold it so that you have. Maybe a, oh, a two to three inch high. And you're going to do the same thing. You're going to put your tailbone on the floor, or you can put your tailbone on the blanket, and you're going to lay your spine on the blanket. Right? So either blanket I or uh, this way. So the objective here, and then you want to take your arms slightly away from your body palms are going to face up and what you want to do is roll your shoulders back and then just allow the chest to open up we can close our eyes here and just breathe feel that sensation of letting go Let your weight release into your mat. And then notice if there's any tightness across your collarbones. Try to let that go. Notice if there's any tightness in your sternum your chest let that go notice if there's any restrictive sensations in your ribs as you breathe try to let the ribs expand a little more And let your body feel really heavy. Melt yourself into the ground. And as you continue to breathe, your heart open, 
become aware of your heartbeat. Maybe think of holding space for yourself and your emotions. Maybe just in general, the principle of being in touch with how you're feeling is something you can think about right now. Be kind to yourself. Be accepting, compassionate to yourself with whatever emotions you're having at any given moment without judging, without being overly self-critical. This is the practice of mindfulness, holding space and being aware and being kind. So recognize that when you do have strong emotions, that it's just part of your human experience. Make that decision to use those moments to learn about yourself. What are those emotions trying to tell you? Maybe there's something in your life that needs your attention. So that's good information. Take about five to eight more breaths here. Let's interlace your fingers and bring your palms up towards the ceiling just to really stretch the upper back. And then take those arms up and over your head. And then take the arms, open them off to the sides, bring them down next to your hips, and then take them interlace and circle them back up towards the ceiling over your head. Just taking nice big circles with your arms. One more. And take the arms off to the side. Go ahead and turn your palms down and lift your knees. So you're gonna bend your legs and take your feet wide. So kind of as wide as your mat maybe. And then these are just gonna go side to side like windshield wipers. And just very gently moving through your hips. Do a few more. And then take your knees over to the right and just set them down. And rest here. And then take your knees over to the other side, set them down. Breathe here.
and bring your legs back up to center and take your feet together and your knees out wide now and if you need to so this is supta baddha konasana if you need to place a block under your knees you're welcome to do that just for a little bit of support if you feel like you're straining in your lower back or your inner thighs so take a few nice easy breaths here And reaching forward lift your knees and let's roll off of the bolster or the blanket <clears throat> I'll take the bolster in front of you and <clears throat> I'm not sure what the uh, how stiff your bolster is Kyla so if it's kind of soft it may not work as well as a, a bolster like this one is pretty it's pretty dense so if if it's if it's kind of soft Kyla use some blocks so we're gonna work on the shoulders so either the bolster or a couple of blocks if you have the blocks you're gonna have one for each elbow so it's gonna be like this <clears throat> And you're just going to place the elbows there on the blocks or the bolster and walk your hips back. So interlace your fingers, palms together, and we're just going to go forward and back. And each time you go back, try to go a little deeper. And then eventually, maybe you can get your forehead down. But take as many repetitions as you need until you, you can take your forehead down comfortably. So you don't want it to be too strenuous. You want to ease into it. And then when you can, take your forehead down. Then go ahead and rest there. Try to settle in here. And see how you're doing. And if it's too much, if you can't quite get all the way down, you rest your forehead on the bolster. But you're, yeah, so that you're not all the way down to the floor. Oh, good. That's it. Good. And then we're going to breathe here. Try to soften across your upper back. And I want you to think of putting down the load, the load that's on your shoulders. Just putting it aside. Not that you're going to neglect any responsibility or burdens. Burdens are kind of part of life. You just have to carry stuff is part of life but you can set them aside or at least physiologically physically you can ease that feeling of carrying that load for a little while refresh yourself so we don't really think of our practice as an escape but more like respite Stepping back, taking care of yourself so that you can re-engage with your life refreshed and renewed and maybe a little stronger and maybe even with a little more perspective.
Just a few more breaths here, letting go through the upper back and the neck. Let's lift your head up just a few inches and slide the right arm underneath you across your mat for thread the needle. And you can either keep that left elbow on the bolster or if you want to um, put it aside, you can. So thread the right arm underneath you. There you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you go back a little bit, Manny, so that your shoulder is on the floor on your uh, mat and then your head is on the bolster so go back a little bit the other way the other way go the other way yeah keep going keep going until your shoulders on the floor the right shoulders on the floor and then your your bolster becomes like a pillow yeah there you go I know is that comfortable Maybe just don't use the bolster, yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> Try to release a little more through the upper back. And keep reaching your hips up. So we're lengthening the spine. And lift your head just a few inches and let's take the left arm underneath. Switch out your arms. You want to go, yeah, go ahead and go on your mat, Manny. And breathe. So left arm underneath. Thread the needle. There you go. And breathe here, relax the upper back, lift up through the hips. And lift yourself up. <clears throat> Let's come to tabletop. And just do some cat cows here. So bringing your knees under your hips, your hands directly under your shoulders. Inhale, lift your chin, lift your tailbone, and let the rest of your spine just follow into the cow pose. And as you exhale, pull up through the belly button and let the head drop, the tailbone points down Lift up through the middle of your back, press the floor away. Good, and do a few more. Inhale, lift your chin, lift your tailbone. Try to find a little more depth each time. Exhale, pull up through the belly. That pose. Let's do two more. Inhale, lift your chin and your tailbone. And exhale, pull up through that belly. Good. 
and come to neutral spine. So let's curl the toes under and lift your hips down dog. And so we're going to experience down dog a little bit differently. Not so much um, power, but more of that feeling of ease and lengthening. We're going to breathe here for a little bit. About three to five more breaths. Let's bring that knee forward for pigeon pose. So setting that right knee down, lengthening the back leg behind you and folding it over, pigeon pose on the right. Just a few more breaths. And lift yourself up. Slide the, that knee back and the other knee forward. Pigeon on the other side. the breath nice and steady. Continue with that feeling of letting go. Just a few more breaths. And inhale, lift yourself up. Slide that knee back. And take your big toes together, knees out wide. Child's pose. So we're going to actually go into child's pose, Manny. So go ahead and take your feet behind you. And let your hips come down towards your feet. Forehead down.
just a few more nice deep breaths. And lift yourself up. <clears throat> Let's come down onto our back. Hug your knees into your chest. And come to happy baby. And straighten your legs, take them up and over for a nice easy plow pose. Nice and easy. Good job. And slowly roll yourself down. Take a fish pose. Lift those shoulder blades off the mat. Roll onto the crown of your head. Matsyasana fish pose. And nice breaths across your chest. And tuck your chin, roll it down. So take a nice easy twist of your choice. You can do one leg at a time or you can do both knees. Make sure you do both sides.
And come back to center and settle in for Shavasana. So find your favorite expression of Shavasana. Usually the legs are a little bit apart. The arms are away from your body. Palms face up. And again, melting your body into the mat. Closing your eyes and being as still as you can be.
deep inhalation to start waking yourself up. <clears throat> Circle those ankles, wrists, maybe stretching. And then bringing your knees in, roll to your side, come up to your seat. Find your meditative seat. Let's do a little pranayama together. So let's do alternate nostril breathing. So you're gonna plug your right nostril. Good, and I have my index finger to my the base of my thumb if that's the method you want to use. We have the thumb for the right nostril, the two middle fingers for the left nostril. All right, so we're gonna plug the left nostril with your thumb and inhale, sorry, plug your right nostril with your thumb, inhale through the left. the left, exhale through the right. Inhale right. Exhale left. Let's do one more together. Inhale left. Exhale right. Inhale right. Exhale left. And keep going on your own. And at the end of this cycle, when you've exhaled through your left, you can bring your hands to your lap or your knees and settle in for a few moments of silence. Feeling tall and erect through your spine, but also very at ease. Along with our open heart, we want to cultivate an open mind, and that requires humility, honesty, and compassion. So being open to knowledge, to truth, and also being open to other beings brothers and sisters on this path, having our minds and our hearts open to each other. Thank you for sharing your practice. Have a wonderful day. Rest of the day. Namaste. All right. So that's um, that's a meditative practice. Um, so I love to share this with, especially I think it's really good as 
speaking more on the physical level of course the mental rest is amazing for our minds I don't know how you feel about listening to ohms but my mind just really loves it it's just so calming right the quiet the the um, clarity that it brings but also physically it's a good practice for maybe like athletes who train really hard um, people with anxiety uh, it, it might be more challenging for people who are restless but sometimes if you are lead in that leadership position and they are you know they buy into it they let you lead them especially like 10 minutes that was a 10 minute shavasana which we don't usually do here in our training but that's that's long for some people but that's what it takes to get completely relaxed so if you give them that space and that protected time and you kind of stand as guardian as well as the leader the authority figure be as relaxed as you can you know don't I don't usually say 10 minutes but that's the cue is to just be as relaxed as you can you know they uh, oftentimes they'll they'll feel the benefit and and they'll they'll be more uh, you know, more compliant to it but for some it might be it, the restless people it might be long but anyway all right any questions comments How you guys feel feel good Good. It feels so good, right? <laughs> Take a quick okay. nap. Huh? Take a quick nap. Yeah, almost like a nap. Totally. I was for sure. <laughs> All right, you guys. Any other questions for me? All good? Yeah. Okay. See you. See you next Friday? Yes. Thursday in California, Friday for you, Manny. We'll see you. Hope you are protected from the rains. So far, so good. Yeah, so far we're okay here in your Belinda. <laughs> All right, thank you. Bye, guys. See you. Bye. Love you. Bye.